Welcome everyone to the fourth day of Lightning Talks. This one has, uh, on short notice, moved to Saal 4. And um, thank you all for coming down here. Sven and B9 Punk are going to guide you through this and call the speakers up. This is actually a two hour slot. So, enjoy. Yes, welcome to the show. Um, the status last day was we would have five talks today and uh, there were three leftovers from yesterday, so that would sum up to eight talks for about an hour. But meanwhile, there were more entries in the wiki. So now for, uh, we have the three talks leftovers from yesterday and 15 for today. So pre be prepared for two hours of lightning talks, and uh, I hope it just all goes smooth. Uh, I still didn't see all the speakers uh, up here. We didn't check all the computers, so be prepared for some delay in between. But I also hear that there are uh, some people here who would speak without any uh, special requirements as for slides. They would just come up here on stage, let's say, and speak freely to you. So I hope you're all prepared to jump in in between. And maybe uh, could I just get a, uh, a hand sign from the speakers, all the speakers in this room, please? Right, so there's two in the back. Would you please uh, move up front here? There's uh, two seats reserved for you. Thanks, guys. Right, so um, there's three, the three leftovers from yesterday. I know the first one is right here, Fukami, who will give the first talk of today. Then there was uh, a woman who uh, also wanted to give a talk. And you were here? Okay, just so, so I know where you are. And then there's the third one from yesterday. And I haven't seen him anywhere. So are you here? Well, if, if anyone who doesn't show up in time will be moved to the end, so that's the rule. We just continue. And we'll start off with Fukami's talk from yesterday. And, uh, oh yeah, shift, shift, shift. So getting set up. Yes, there's lots of room for improvement for these lighting talks, as you probably noticed. We've taken notes, but just in case we missed one, we would like to remind you that on the website there's a button to give feedback. So you can vote on something and you can leave a note. <laughs> That's cool. We will actually take a look at these notes, you know. So please do make use of them. Please do enter something. And yes. Yes. This kind of problem we had before. So. No problem. <coughs> hey, so, Fukami, here you go. Um, I'm going to talk in German, although my uh, slides are in English, because it's mainly uh, an idea we want to have for uh, the German community. So, <coughs> so that's the reason why I'm, I'm going to talk in German. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, um, also das Thema... Um, ja, Datenverlust äh, ist aus dem Grund mal vor einiger Zeit so in, äh, in unseren Fokus geraten, also vor einigen Tagen vor allem, weil es ja immer wieder so Vorfälle gibt, wo eine Menge an äh, persönlichen Daten verloren geht. Ähm also es gibt halt diesen, diesen Zustand, dass wirklich jeder Firma irgendwie ähm, jeden Kram, was sie sich aufweist, Nummern, Kreditkarten und so weiter, ähm, speichert, inklusive Adressdaten, Namen, E-Mail-Adressen und so weiter. Und äh, es gibt in, in Deutschland und auch soweit ich weiß in Europa kein Land, in dem diese Sachen in irgendeiner Form geregelt sind. Wobei wir natürlich als sozusagen ähm, als Nutzer dieser Plattform und so weiter einfach schon ähm, informiert sein wollen darüber, äh, wenn da halt ein Security Breach stattgefunden hat und man weiß, dass die Daten, die auf diesem Server lagen, irgendwie in der Welt verteilt wurden. Und ähm, ja da eben sehr viele von diesen Sachen auch benutzt werden können für etwas, was es hier, in, hier in, äh, nein, in Deutschland vor allem auch noch nicht so sehr gibt, nämlich Identitätsdiebstahl, ich weiß nicht in dem Maß, wie es in Amerika ist. Wie wir das erwarten können, ähm, sind wir jetzt so dabei, mal zu überlegen, was wir eigentlich so machen können. Es gibt ein Beispiel in den Staaten, ähm, das ist die, äh, 
DLDOS, das ist äh, die Data Loss ähm, Datenbank von Attrition.org, die bekannt geworden sind durch den Defacement Mirror früher und angefangen haben, ähm, Incidents zu tracken, in, in denen ähm, große Firmen äh, oder Institutionen, ähm, Universitäten, irgendwie Bundesbehörden und so weiter Daten verlieren und äh, eben veröffentlicht haben, sozusagen mit Anzahl der Datennetze, die verloren gegangen sind, plus was diese Datennetze enthalten haben, ähm, das publizieren. Und das liegt daran, dass äh, in Amerika, in manchen Bundesstaaten Gesetze existieren, die das regulieren und wir sind äh, der Meinung, dass das eine gute Idee ist. Ähm, ja, und diese Liste gibt es, also, äh, also besteht aus drei Teilen eigentlich, nämlich immer eine Mailingliste, einem RSS-Feed, den man abonnieren kann und es gibt diese Liste der Vorgänge als CSV-Datei. Ich habe schon gesagt, dass hier, also in Deutschland sieht es ein bisschen anders aus, im Moment ist es so, dass äh, es keine Verpflichtung gibt von den Firmen, das zu melden, das heißt, wenn sowas passiert, dann hört man das meistens über irgendeine Security-Firma oder über Bekannte oder... Wenn man halt irgendwie mal einen Pentest gemacht hat und jemand erzählt, ja, ja da war mal irgendwas. Aber ähm, eigentlich ähm, gibt es sowas nicht und das ist gut und schlecht. Also, gut, also schlecht ist daran, dass eben die Nutzer der Plattform das nicht wissen. Gut daran ist, dass man sehr oft sozusagen so eine Vorfälle, wie auch immer, so klärt, dass der, der da aus Versehen, der, also aus Versehen oder wie auch immer, auf der Seite was gefunden hat, sich die Firmen in der Regel nicht schadhaft an dem halten, was natürlich ganz anders werden könnte, wenn die Firmen verpflichtet wären dazu, ähm, solche Vorfälle zu melden. Also, das ist halt so eine von den Diskussionen, die man sicherlich äh, führen muss. Und wie gesagt, es gibt halt keine Regulierung. Ähm, was wir eigentlich gerne wollen, ist, dass man Firmen und auch staatliche Stellen, ähm, die mit persönlichen Daten von Nutzern zu tun haben und die solche Vorfälle haben, das melden müssen. Und ähm, ja, sind sogar in der Diskussion so weit, dass wir gerne, ähm, ja, oder dass wir halt überlegen, äh, das so weit zu bringen, äh, das wirklich in die, in die Gesetzgebung oder so zu bringen. Bisher gibt es, weil es eine recht fusche Idee ist, noch nicht viel. Äh, wir fangen an, haben wir eine Mailingliste eingerichtet, dataloss at köln ccc.de, ähm, auf der wir so ein paar Sachen diskutieren wollen. Das heißt, wie man sowas publiziert, wie man sowas zusammensammelt, was wir eigentlich wollen und so weiter. Wie gesagt, die Diskussion ist frisch, deswegen auch hier nur als Lightning Talk und nicht viel mehr. Okay, das war's schon. Yes, and today, just another reminder, there's three, three things that you must do with your data. First is a backup, second, another backup, and third, backups. And uh, so here we go. This was really good in time. Thank you very much, Fukami. Next on our list would be you, whose name, her name I forgot <laughs> right now, sorry. Please introduce yourself very quickly, and uh, I, you're just giving a talk from your handout, like uh, this? No, we have slides. Ah, oh, we got yeah, slides. Yeah. Good, you're here. Yeah. Okay. No, it's not the right slide. Yeah, hold on. Okay. Okay, all right, that's it. So uh, my name is Ann Harrison. And I work for a group called Benetech, which is a nonprofit tech company in California. And we create uh, tools for the human rights community and for disabled people. Uh, about five years ago, uh, Benetech uh, teamed up with Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch and a bunch of other uh, grassroots human rights groups to create a tool called MARTIS, uh, which helps human rights groups uh, collect, organize, encrypt and securely back up really sensitive information. About 10,000 human rights groups operate around the world, but they lose a lot of data due to confiscation, destruction, theft, neglect, etc. And it makes it really difficult for these human rights groups to uh, collect data and give it to prosecutors and truth commissions to use to prosecute people for human rights abuses. So uh, they asked us to develop a tool, and here are some of the features that Martis offers. This is what they wanted. They wanted it to be easy to use, uh, easy to configure, ability to search and sort bulletins, backup servers for safeguarding information, very important, uh, and a web search engine for public data. Um, let's go to the next slide. So uh, this is the Martis workspace. Gives you a sense of what the interface looks like. Uh, the Martis tool is free, it's open source, it's in eight languages, including Arabic, Thai, Russian, Spanish, Persian, Nepali, and French, and English, no German yet, sorry, 
If someone would like to translate, we're always looking for translators. We're especially looking for Portuguese, Pashtun, Dari, and Farsi translators. Our fastest growing language is Arabic. And we also look for code review. Our code is up on SourceForge. So next slide. So you download Martis off martis.org, M-A-R-T-U-S. You create a password-protected account, generate a series of bulletins. This is bulletins. Sorry about the, the fuzziness there. And um, you can attach uh, other documents or files or image files to this bulletin. Uh, the data is encrypted locally on the user's machine and backed up to their choice of servers, uh, the Martis Project runs uh, four servers around the world managed by nonprofit groups. Let's go to the next slide. So uh, you can attach files, as I say, of any format to Martis bulletins. Uh, you can scan an information, photos, text files, spreadsheets, etc. Next slide. Uh, there is some information that you can keep completely private and information that you can choose to share with other members of your organization or the public. Uh, data sharing was an, a really essential feature of this tool, really important. Next slide. Um, this just gives you an idea of, of uh, how to share information with your headquarters. Uh, a lot of NGOs have uh, headquarters and then field offices, and this gives you uh, some sense of how the tool allows people to do that. Next slide. So uh, you can select who sees your information bulletin by bulletin, which information is private and which is shared. Next slide. Um, and this, is, this shows a little bit about uh, how Martis can be customized. Each organization collects different information. Um, and uh, this gives you a sense of uh, the kind of customization you can do with this tool. Uh, it was really important that human rights groups were able to just customize it to collect the data that they wanted. At the moment, our servers are located in uh, Hungary, Kenya, the Philippines. We just moved our Seattle server to Vancouver, Canada. <laughs> If you know an NGO that uh, has a, a physically secure colo facility, please talk to me. We would love to have a server here in Germany and one in Amsterdam as well, and we're working on that, thanks to folks here. Traffic analysis is obviously is a really big deal for us, and we're a big fan of Tor. Yes. I'd like to make the point here that we're not talking about privacy. We're talking about safety. This is life and death information. We don't make the privacy argument. We make the safety argument. So it's a, it's a different thing. Uh, next slide. So Martis is totally searchable. If you create uh, an encrypted database, you can share. You have to be able to search it. So this has really powerful search features. So they can enter in a bunch of data and uh, search it, get the information that they need. Um, Martis is used to protect human rights uh, data and witnesses in 15 countries around the world, including Iraq, Burma, Colombia, Guatemala, and the United States, my home country, where it's used to encrypt and securely back up the legal documents used to defend the Guantanamo prisoners, which is very sensitive data, obviously. Um, you know, because it's freely downloadable off our site, um, both the client and the server software is freely downloadable. Uh, anyone can set up a, a Martis uh, server. We don't know exactly how many people are using the tool, and it's really none of our business. So if you want more information about this, uh, feel free to email me. My email address is anann.h at benetech, B-E-N-E-T-E-C-H, Org. I'm sorry I don't have more CDs to hand out. I have uh, already handed out a bunch of them, but uh, you can download it right off the website, and uh, we'd be happy to assist you or any other NGO that you know of. It's also used by lawyers, activists, journalists, and a bunch of other people who have really good reasons to keep their data secure. Thanks. This was nearly five minutes on the second. Great sense of timing. So there's one leftover from yesterday. Has this guy turned up? Do you know who you are? Do you remember? No. All right, so we continue with today's round of talks as uh, presented from the wiki. So on number one here is Christoph Strasen, and he's already re uh, sorry, ready. Um, would you like to just 
Try now. <laughs> so right now. Uh, for next time, yes. One of the notes of the feedback that we got from uh, the wiki of obviously says, well, you've, uh, you should have done this better preparing, but uh, I think we should put uh, into the wiki for next time that we re really require the break before the talks to actually test things and that we ask the speakers to be there within the break to test that. So uh, obviously we didn't stress this out uh, strongly enough, but we will do this for the next time. So please keep the comments com uh, coming on. Go to the uh, Lightning Talks website and click on the feedback button to give us some more ideas for improvement. Uh, while Christoph is setting up, let me just give you an idea. Is it working? I don't think it's, it's working. You don't think so? Out. Um, we test this later on. Yeah. Well, let's test this a little später. Okay. Because slides for this talks are vital, uh, we will reschedule this a little bit. So we would go, go on, continue with you, Justin here. So you got your things ready or slides here? Oh yes, there's a web page and uh, B9Punk will be calling up on this. Just a sec. Okay. I think the this should be on. Could you give it a test? Hello. Okay, it works. Um, hi, yes, I'm. my name's Justin oh, Kelly. Jason, I'm a... You are too far off the micro. Please go the Hello. Can you hear me now? Okay. My name is Justin Kelly. I'm a just a regular web developer, um, part-time hacker, I guess. Um, I'm going to talk about just a little hack, a, a hacked site that I discovered a while back, and it was a PH, PHP program. Let me give you this. It's probably better if you okay. Turning around. You guys can hear me? Okay. Um, I was, um, first bit of advice, if you guys ever want to become really good hackers, don't delete your spam. <laughs> well, other than the Nigerian princes with the $30 million, you can delete them. But the phishing mails, I got a phishing mail one day, and I've always got in the habit of whatever URL they put in the mail, keep stripping off bits of it, like the, the bottom directory and the file name to get a little bit higher into the URL, because sometimes the guys who write these uh, hacks don't always do them very well. So anyway, the one I discovered was this program um, called Hacksplorer. And what it is, it's a PHP, a, um, like a, a file browser written in PHP, which runs from your web server. And if you, when you build your web page, if you have file uploads and you don't protect them properly, somebody can upload this program called Hacksplorer. And if the uploaded file, at least if it has a .php extension, and if it's within the um, public HTML space, they can access all the files on your hard drive. Um, Okay, here's an example. I'm not sure of how well this is going to work right now because um, I also unwittingly hacked my own site here. This comes in two parts. I think this Hacksplorer part, is, this is the actual um, file browser, which I think isn't going to work, so I'm not going to actually going to click on it right now. But it also comes with this other nifty little utility called PHP Console. And basically what PHP Console is, is a is an actual terminal that runs from the web page that they can actually run Unix commands on your server. So you can type, for instance, ls space minus al. Boom. And it didn't work. 
probably because I made the mistake of, of keeping the name as index PHP on this thing. But anyway, if it works properly, what you would have is you would actually see the full readout of if, as if you had typed ls minus al in the public HTML directory on the server. Um, on the Hack Explorer, you have a full let's see, you you have a full file browser, so you can actually you can click on the, the you have like the the single dot for current directory. And you have the two dots for the directory above the current directory. By the way, I'm going to delete this as soon as the talk is over, so don't anyone get any ideas. And also, I have nothing interesting on that server. We already. You did, okay. Uh, did it work? Because <laughs> I couldn't get it to work here, so maybe you know something I don't. But yeah, so anyway, this is actually a, a pretty easy program to write if you know uh, PHP. And I'm pretty sure there's also Perl versions of it out there and there's Java versions. Um, so whatever, just because your, your, your browser runs a different program, don't assume that it's safe. So like I say, the, the way to protect this, if you're a web developer, is, or at least what I do, because I also write web, websites where I have file uploads, is, as they always say, verify, verify, verify. The first thing I do is I check that the file that's being uploaded, if it's going into the somewhere in the public HTML space, make sure it's not a text file. Okay, so I make sure what I did was I make sure that the, the MIME type is either JPEG, GIF, or even RTF or Microsoft Word is still okay. But do not let people upload plain text files, and you will solve this problem. There's also the whole thing with, with setting permissions and everything, which will also help. The tighter the permission, the better. And remember, this runs as whatever user that Apache runs as, which is either Apache or WWW, which doesn't have much power anyway, but they can, it can usually read most stuff on your hard drive. So if you have important stuff... To, oh, by the way, I'll also mention that the site I did find this on, I was actually able to get somebody's banking information from. I did not use it, by the way. I, So be warned. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for that. Thanks, Justin. So next on our list is Justus Winter. Are you here? Oh, is he ready? Yeah, you, are you ready? You got the slides? Oh, yes. Um, open documents is fine. But we don't have actually a presenter PC here that's stationary. So, what if it doesn't work? Does it allow you to save it as a PDF? Uh, I do it in PDF. Yeah. Oh, okay, rerun in PDF. So, actually, yes, next on our list is Justus Winter. I'm both that's you? Network and the beam. Okay. All right. This is very short. It's fun. Um, we, we, yeah, we switched places then. Although, then now I'm off. Okay, <laughs> hi. I'm uh, going to show you how to uh, create a session writing exploit for an uh, in-production web application in uh, just under five minutes. Um, I hope it will work. And um, I'm not going to do too much talking. Um, you can, it's, it's a brain dead, brain simple um, process. You can uh, easily watch it, okay? I'm going to try to uh, comment uh, stuff. Okay. Yeah. That's not that important. <laughs> okay, we are going to attack uh, Foot Forum. Okay. Then I have no hand for him. 
we are going to attack uh, food forum and they have a um, test forum which we are going to use so we can uh, post uh, topics here and we are going to do so um, I prepared a little text and it's a kind of a social hack involved we need to get users of the web application to click on it um, and we just create a simple message here. And oh, they have these uh, little uh, captures, very funny. <laughs> they must messed up, I'll show you. Create topic. Okay. And we are going to uh, click on post, reply. And we just save uh, this uh, file on our hard uh, disk, just uh, to be able to edit it. Okay. Okay, great. That's great. Just, uh, yeah. That's it. And um, I'm going to uh, look for this uh, form. Oh, great. No, that's PayPal. It's here. Post. And I'll uh, replace the action with my own little script. It's a very simple uh, script that just, um, you'll see. And uh, now I load this page. Yeah. And I have the same uh, form pointing at my web application and I just can use the, um, the way I would normally do. Um, uh, great side, great. <laughs> and there's this little capture. It's really funny. I see JT. Submit. And now um, my web application uh, creates uh, two files as a post request, so we need two files. And um, it's uh, just cutting uh, some stuff into uh, files. Uh, basically, it's just an HTML file loading an uh, iframe. The exploit.html file creates a post request, and we just uh, uh, replace the action URL back um, to the original formula and we just have um, um, two HTML files creating a little uh, session writing exploit and um, they are here index HTML and uh, exploit HTML and I'm going to copy them to our um, uh, server and just get back and now we have an actually working session writing exploit so uh, we have this uh, food forum and we have a link in it and if uh, any uh, user of the food forum opens this link and is logged in uh, which is uh, pointless here because anonymous uh, users can post uh, things here. Um, we have this uh, nice and friendly comment uh, mm, uh, content page which in fact loads an iframe which uh, creates uh, a post request on the um, web application and if we uh, reload this my time is up. There's a great site and someone uh, um, already uh, clicked on it. Great, great. <laughs> One more thing. Um, you, uh, there was a capture, and you say, ooh, there was a capture. This should protect against this kind of stuff. They messed up badly. Just a uh, little thing. Um, there's this Turing test. And here's the AGCJT. Uh, and uh, below there is a string and guess what the MD5 sum of ACJT is. <laughs> it's a string below, so this does not help. Great, thanks.
So, exploits for fun. Christoph, you're, uh, you, you'll be ready here for, the, for your next talk. By the way, um, we opened up another channel for this very room on IRC. So that would be on freenow.org. And uh, it's the name of the channel is 23, 23 c 3 underscore Saal 4. Saal 4 is room for room 4. So you can join there and please give us some feedback or tell us that actually the time is up and we are sleeping here. <laughs> so there you are. And Christoph is all set up to go. Thank you. Hello, hello guys. Okay, now, thank you for allowing me to speak here at the Lightning Talks. Uh, for the international audience, sorry, this uh, presentation is going to be in, in German. Also, hallo nochmal. Ich bin der Christoph. Ich spreche für mich selbst als als Freak und langjähriger Computernutzer und IT-Mensch, aber auch für die Piratenpartei in Deutschland. Ähm, mein Vortrag lautet eigentlich ein strate strategischer Rückblick auf verlorene Schlachten, aber das ist eine Weile her. Äh, wir formulieren es ein bisschen ausgeglichener. Wir machen uns Gedanken äh, zum Kampf für Bürgerrechte. Deshalb wird das heute ein bisschen soziopolitischer werden. Äh, next slide, please. Wir sind alle hier, weil wir etwas gemeinsam haben. Wir haben Wissen und Erfahrungen gemacht, die andere in der Bevölkerung nicht gemacht haben. Wir sind ein kleiner Teil von Freaks, sagen die meisten, die uns kennen oder auch nicht so gut kennen, 4000 hier heute. Und was gehört uns eigentlich? Gehört uns das Netz? Gehören uns die Programme? Gehört uns die GPL V3 oder die Zweier? Wer hat Einfluss? Wer bestimmt, wo es lang geht? Der CCC und viele andere Organisationen haben es oft versucht, die Richtung zu bestimmen. Oft erfolgreich, oft wurden sie äh, mit Lob wiedergegeben. Allerdings spiegelt es sich nicht wieder in aktuellen, aktuellen politischen Ereignissen. Next slide, please. Also, was habt ihr? Das Einzige, was ihr habt, ist die Macht des Faktischen. Ihr habt das Netz gegründet, ihr füllt es heute noch mit Leben. Ihr habt nicht den politischen Einfluss auf das Netz, ihr stellt keine Regularien auf, ihr könnt keine Filter setzen, ihr könnt euch das Netz nicht kaufen, ihr könnt die ICAN nicht ablösen, alles nicht so einfach. Die macht es faktisch, aber die ist nicht gering. Warum haben alle Leute Angst vor der GPL V3? Weil sie ihre Pfründe schwinden sehen. Die Erfahrungen, die ihr gesammelt habt, das Wissen, das ihr einbringt, von dem sie profitieren wollen. Next slide, please. Das ist das, was ich sehe, wie diese kurze Milchmädchenrechnung aussieht, nämlich eine, eine Tendenz, die, <lacht> ja, eine Tendenz die, die sich vielleicht bei manchen im Gemüt widerschlägt. Äh, andere glauben nicht daran oder, oder malen andere Zukunftsszenarien. Äh, diese ganze Bewegung ist erst in den letzten zwei, drei, vier Jahren so richtig in Schwung gekommen. Ich kann mir vorstellen, äh, dass es vor drei Jahren nicht möglich gewesen wäre, eine Partei wie unsere zu gründen oder äh, Konferenzen stattfinden zu lassen, die immer ein größeres Medienecho bekommen. Einfach weil die Themen, die uns bewegen, eine größere Relevanz bekommen. Man sieht es hier gut an den Steigerungsraten, die ich vorhersage. Äh, Warum geht es 2011 wieder aufwärts bei Freiheit und Nutzen? Ja, weil, weil die Community vielleicht nachgezogen habt. Ihr merkt es, was die Politiker jetzt tun. Sie fangen langsam an zu verstehen. Sie begreifen langsam, wie die Netze funktionieren. Es hat lange Ruhe geherrscht, Gott sei Dank. Aber sie begreifen bloß das, was sie für ihre tägliche Arbeit brauchen, was sie für ihren Nutzen brauchen. Und sie haben nicht die Macht des Faktischen, noch nicht. Aber die politische Macht, Dinge umzusetzen, wie die Vorratsdatenspeicherung, wie die Softwarepatente auf europäischer Ebene, wie Datenweitergabe, Datenschutzrichtlinien und so weiter und so fort. Es wird gute Arbeit daran getan, von vielen Organisationen dagegen anzukämpfen. Aber wird sie gehört? Die Frage möchte ich einfach offen in den Raum stellen. Ich glaube nämlich nicht, dass sie gehört wird und dass sie diese steil orange Kurve nicht aufhalten kann. Next slide, please. Es ist sehr provokant, hier eine 
vierte schwarze Kurve hineinzumalen. Aber ich glaube, dass die Mächtigen dieser Welt von nichts mehr Angst haben, als ihre Macht zu verlieren. Wir haben es in Schweden gesehen, 0,6 Prozent bei einer schwedischen Wahl, ist nicht viel, aber alle haben sie ihr Programm umgeschrieben. Alle anderen. Wenn das ein kleiner Beitrag dazu sein kann, den orangen Trend ein bisschen abzuschwächen, hilft es vielleicht der Community, die an allen Ecken kämpft, die vier <lacht> Meldungen, bei denen man einen dicken Hals bekommen kann, auf heise pro Tag schlucken muss. Vielleicht kann es der Community helfen, am Ende das zu bekommen, was sie doch eigentlich schon immer hat. Okay. Ähm, also, ich würde euch dazu aufrufen, ihr seid die Ureinwohner der Datennetze, möchte ich sagen. Lasst euch einfach nicht vertreiben. Next slide, please. Umso länger wir warten, desto schlimmer wird es. Patrick hat gestern beim, nein, vorgestern beim Arbeitskreis Vorratsdatenspeicherung gesagt, hätten wir vor zwei Jahren, vor einem Jahr angefangen, wo wären wir dann heute? Dann wären wir vielleicht mit der Gegenentwicklung schon viel weiter. Deshalb nicht lange abwarten, einfach machen. Next slide. Das ist das, was ich dazu sagen kann. Ich, wir wollen euch nicht benutzen, aber wir sagen, benutzt, benutzt uns. Keine Vereinnahmung, Zusammenarbeit. Und vielleicht neuer Slogan, Political Engineering. Viele Werkzeuge, ein Ziel. Dankeschön. Wenn ihr noch mit mir diskutieren wollt, ich bin danach noch eine Weile anwesend. Hagen, are you in this room? There he is. Okay, so next on our list is Hagen Zankowski, and he's going to tell us about why open software won't work without open hardware. The talk will be in German, I guess? I th you think so. <laughs> Good. Do um, you got any slides to show, or do you just do it from here? Okay, then I'll give you the microphone. We do this. I got it, I got it. Okay, here we go. Okay, sorry, ähm, dass ich jetzt mit Deutsch weitermache. Ähm, hätten keine Sprachprobleme <lacht> in den letzten Wochen gehabt. Ähm, ich würde fürchten, ich würde anfangen, Russisch zu sprechen, wenn ich jetzt irgendwie auf Englisch sprechen sollte, weil es für mich die zweite Fremdsprache ist. Okay, ähm, okay. wie war der Stand früher oder wie kam es eigentlich dazu, dass ein Computer so erfolgreich wurde? Der IBM-PC hat sich durchgesetzt, einfach aus dem Fakt raus, früher, als man Hardware gekauft hat, hat man ein dickes Handbuch dazu gekriegt, ordnerweise, regalmeterweise, äh, wo drin stand, wie das Ding zu benutzen ist, wie die Hardware aufgebaut ist, wie sie funktioniert. Da wird, wird jetzt jedes einzelne Beinchen beschrieben. Konnte man sozusagen darauf aufbauen, auf dieser Dokumentation eine Software dafür schreiben. Die Situation hat sich leider verändert. Auch wenn sozusagen die Handbücher verschwunden worden sind, sie werden nicht mehr unbedingt vollständig auf das D mitgeliefert oder sonst wie. Heutzutage ist es so, man kriegt Hardware und man kriegt eine Disk dazu, wo sozusagen ein Treiber drauf ist. Ist ein bisschen ungünstig, wenn man sagt, also ich will freie und offene Software machen. Deswegen meine provokante These, ohne freie und offene Hardware kann es keine freie und offene Software geben. Ähm, okay. Denn der Zustand jetzt, ja, der sagt ja einfach, wenn ich nur einen Binary Driver habe für ein Betriebssystem aus Redmond, kann ich damit mit dem Pinguin nicht mit viel anfangen. Mit dem BSD oder sowas, wo BSD sagt, ich will von jedem Programm immer quelloffen haben. Binary Driver sind verpönt, auch nicht. Also, der Computer heutzutage oder Komponenten dafür, Netzwerkkarten, ganz prominentes Beispiel, Grafikkarten, sind einfach nur eine Blackbox. 3D-Effekte mit einer Grafikkarte kann man sich abschminken, weil man nicht mehr weiß, wie die Grafikkarte anzusteuern ist, wie der Chipsatz darauf funktioniert. WLAN-Karten sind alle nur ein Hack. Also das Vertrauen verschwindet erstmal im Computer, weil man kann die Hardware nicht mehr durchschauen. Auch das schöne Motto hier von unserem Kongress, Vertrauen. Wie kann man der Hardware trauen, wenn es nicht mehr geht? Zweiter Punkt, wie kann man es umgehen? Oder? Ähm, was macht man jetzt damit? Also man kann zum Beispiel sich hinsetzen und macht Reverse Engineering. Landet man aber genau an dem Punkt, den viele, viele Nutzer beklagen, warum sich Linux nicht so schön durchsetzt. Die Hardware-Unterstützung ist darum miserabel. Man hängt genau an dem Punkt. 
dass irgendjemand sich in mühevoller Kleinarbeit hinsetzen muss und erstmal die Hardware auseinanderpflücken muss. Wie funktioniert die? Wird sie aufgeschraubt und sonst was gemacht? Es dauert Zeit. Das Ergebnis davon ist hochträchtig fehleranfällig. Derjenige, der das Ding reverse engineert, hat niemals die Manpower, hat niemals die Möglichkeiten zur Hand, wie die vielen äh, Ingenieure, die sich hingesetzt haben, die Hardware gebastelt haben. Dokumentationen dazu bekommen, hm, okay, so wie früher, Regal mit der Weise. Geht man hin zum Hersteller und sagt, ich will eine Dock haben. Ich habe hier eine WLAN-Karte, da ist ein Chipsatz drauf von TI, so wie es mir mal ging. Ich hätte gern mal die Dokumentation dazu. Da haben die mir gesagt, ja, schön, wenn Sie uns eine Stückzahl abnehmen von mindestens 10.000, uns garantieren können im Jahr, dann können Sie mit uns ein NDE vereinbaren. Non-Disclosure Agreement. Heißt so viel wie Geheimhaltungsvereinbarung, frei übersetzt. So. Wenn ich aber so ein Ding unterschreibe, dann darf ich Informationen, die mir aufgrund der Dokumentation zugänglich geworden sind, nicht veröffentlichen. Heißt für mich auch, ich bin nicht in der Lage, einen freien Quelltext dafür zu machen, weil in meinem Quelltext gibt es irgendwo eine Header-Datei, steht drin, in dem Register befindet sich das, in dem Register befindet sich das. Und das ist genau die Information, die mit dem NDE geschützt werden sollte. Fällt also aus die Möglichkeit. Okay, dritter Punkt. Wie gesagt, es gibt ein Betriebssystem aus Redmond, steht immer so schön dick drauf auf der Packung, wird supported. Dafür gibt es Treiber. Aber es ist ein ganz idiotischer Ansatz, um diesen Treiber drumherum einen Weber schreiben zu wollen. Ähm, sagen, okay, wir tun jetzt mal so, als wären wir dieses Betriebssystem und, und benutzen genau den Treiber so. Denn dieser Treiber funktioniert immer nur mit einer Hardware-Architektur. Meistens irgendwo x86. Jetzt will ich aber eine Netzwerkkarte vielleicht auch mit einem Spark benutzen. Pustekuchen, dafür gibt es keinen Treiber, den ich Binary retten kann. Ich kann auch beim BSD nicht irgendwo einen Binary-File daneben legen und sagen, also hier von wegen, das soll jetzt eingebunden werden, das geht nicht. Auch wenn BSD in der Lizenz sagt, ja, 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 auch wenn BSD in der Lizenz sagt, ihr könnt damit machen, was ihr wollt, der Quelltext muss auf alle Fälle frei sein. Okay, viertes Argument, das Wissen geht verloren. Ich bin aus der Branche, ich mache Chips, das Wissen dazu, wie man Hardware herstellt, landet unweigerlich oder konzentriert sich unweigerlich mehr, immer mehr in Asien und Amerika, nicht mehr in Europa. Futsch, Studium, Universitäten ist schon lange abgehangen. Fünfter Punkt, Hardware zu entwickeln, kann sehr, sehr geekig sein. Macht Spaß, mir zumindest, vielen anderen auch, äh, macht nicht jeder, also ein Aufruf an euch, setzt euch damit auseinander, guckt euch die einschlägigen Seiten an, bastelt meinetwegen auch am Oscar rum, das soll ein Open-Source-Auto werden. Äh, guckt euch Seiten an wie opencores.org, wo äh, freie Cores drauf sind, also so Komponenten für Chips. Äh, guckt euch das Open-Graphics-Projekt an, die versuchen eine Grafikkarte zu machen. Ja. Und das Schöne ist, diese Hardware, die dabei rauskommt, so wie man es von Linux kennt, unterstützt natürlich freie Formate, äh, ist patentfrei, offene Standards und dergleichen mehr. So, wie man es eigentlich haben will. Aber nur mit so einem Gegengewicht schaffen es eigentlich die Hardwarehersteller auch, darüber nachzudenken oder anfangen, na, darüber nachzudenken, äh, mit ihrem proprietären Scheiß aufzuhören. Okay, schönen Dank. Okay, next on our list would be the guys uh, who, who announced themselves as anonymous. Are they here? The anonymous people? And <laughs> Hands up well, from everybody who wants to be anonymous. <laughs> All right, so uh, it's probably they're so anonymous and so stealth that nobody can see them. Just a moment. They be here in a moment. You hope so. Well, we do too. But we are going to skip them anyway because they don't show up, right? So next on our list would be Martin Recker to tell us something about uh, another event coming up pretty soon in Augsburg. And there he is, and he'll tell you all about. Please get set up. No. Uh,
just try to uh, plug it in and see if it works, and if it does, it's fine. We could start. The, the cons the, Mr. Anonymous is here, or Mrs. Anonymous, I have no idea. So there's... <laughs> right, small setup here, but uh, please stay tuned. This thing is about, uh, it's titled Console Hacking Surprise. And the description says, Be Surprised. For those of you standing in the back, if you really want to get a good shot at this, uh, you would have to come up front. Actually, on this side, there's still some seats left, so that's your chance to actually come up here and get a good view on that. Oh, it just looks like an uh, animated picture slide of an Xbox. <laughs> but hey, anyone can have that, right? Just download it and... Uh, it's the Xbox. It is the Xbox? Oh, come on. Yeah. So I'm just wondering whether Mr. Anonymous is going to talk about it or not. <laughs> Wingnut Films? Wingnut Films? King Kong? <laughs> the suspense is killing me. There you go. Um, it was obviously an Xbox and it wasn't really running what it's supposed to be doing. And uh, there's more to be coming soon. So, thank you very much for that. It reminds me of, about those cartoons which were titled Without Words. You know? Picture says it all. So, again, there's a small reminder for you to join our IRC channel on freenode.org. So, that's the server name is obviously ircfreenode.org, and the channel name is uh, hashmarked. 23C3 underscore Zal4. That's S double A L 
four. And more joining, joining. That's nice. Hey, you. So on our list again. So this is Martin Röcke from Augsburg, southern Germany. And this is about an event taking place there. Can you hear me? Ah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm doing this talk in German because it's a, about a small event. It's only held in German there, so that's better, I think. Okay. Ähm, ich bin aus Augsburg und wir organisieren von der Linux User Group in Augsburg immer einen Infotag. Möchte darauf bloß aufmerksam machen. Jetzt denkt ihr euch, wenn ihr das erste Wort seht, oh Augsburg, das ist ja Bayern, da habt ihr recht. Ähm, kann ich jetzt nichts dagegen sagen, es ist aber auch Schwaben, da gibt es ganz tolle Käsespätzle. Ja, das ist zum Beispiel schon mal was ganz Tolles, was wir haben. Dann haben wir natürlich die Augsburger Puppekischt, da können sie auch mal vorbeikommen. Ähm, das ist, also ihr könnt es ja verbinden, weil es ist natürlich für euch eine weite Reise, aber ich finde, es lohnt sich. Es ist ein kleines Event. Wir haben immer so, keine Ahnung, 200, 300 Besucher da. Und was es da so gibt, ja, bisher. Es ist ein Vortragsprogramm, mehrere Tracks parallel. Letztes Jahr waren es auch vier, wobei wir dann festgestellt haben, dass dann doch zu viel parallel ist. Und darum machen wir vielleicht wieder bloß Zwei und eine Reihe Workshops oder so mit ähm, irgendwelchen Bastelanleitungen zusammen basteln oder je nachdem. Ähm, ist immer eine ganz nette Sache. Abends geht man danach normal zusammen irgendwie noch in so eine Kneipe, eben Spätzle essen oder irgendwas anderes. Äh, ja, dass man sich ein bisschen kennenlernt. Also wirklich kleine Sache, nicht so groß wie hier. Ähm, aber vielleicht ist ja jemand von euch aus der Gegend oder will einfach mal nach Augsburg kommen. Der kann sich das dann äh, irgendwie nett vielleicht verbinden mit einem schönen Aufenthalt. Ähm, das Blöde ist jetzt, der Termin steht noch nicht ganz fest. Normalerweise ist es immer Ende März, äh, immer am Samstag und normalerweise immer so am Wochenende nach der CeBIT. Das wäre jetzt dieses Jahr, äh, nächstes Jahr dann der 24. oder 31. schätze ich mal, dass es da irgendwann stattfinden wird. Ähm, Genau, und was ich jetzt suche, das sind Leute, die da mitmachen wollen, die vielleicht, also also natürlich könnt ihr einfach kommen, vorbeischauen, aber wenn jemand einen Vortrag halten will, würde ich mich freuen, wenn sich da jemand bei mir meldet, sagt, ja, ich will zu dem und dem Thema irgendwas erzählen, einfach mir schreiben. Ähm, wichtig für euch wäre dann bloß die Adresse von der Luca, da steht dann immer weitere Infos, das Programm, sobald es die ersten Vortragsthemen gibt, äh, ist immer aktuell, dann im Nachhinein die PDFs. Ihr könnt mir per Chaba schreiben, ähm, wenn ihr meine E-Mail-Adresse sucht, das findet ihr auch auf der Webseite von der Luga und da ist auch eine Mailingliste lit.luga.de oder sowas, aber weitere Informationen findet ihr dann da. Genau, würde mich freuen, wenn da vielleicht ein paar vorbeischauen, das ist mal eine ganz nette Aktion und das war es schon von meiner Seite aus. Viel Spaß noch, danke. Yes, thank you, Martin. Next on our list uh, is Marcel. Marcel is getting ready to set up. It's uh, It has a very interesting uh, acronym. I will start with the expansion, let's say. Yet another XAC together of West and East, which reads Y-A-X-W-E. Uh, Suggestions from pronunciation are welcome. Please join our ICs channel and that switch to Marcel. Down there is a switch. Hi. Hi. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so just um, another way of uh, to pronounce the Yakswe is Yahwe, but whoever the is offended by Yahwe could use Yakswe. So that the <laughs> couple of things which I uh, need to say to you. It's what is Yahweh and um, what is Yahweh about and the other thing is uh, where Yahweh will happen and who's the organizer. Um, so there are two possible starts. One is uh, to introduce it with a very smart concept uh, with a catchy question like who can you trust or something like that. 
or I can start with photos. And uh, as we have much better photos to show than CCC, again with no offense, I will start with photos. Um, oops. Yeah, it's on Flickr. Uh, it's just a um, Pula tag, because it will happen in Pula, Croatia, Adriatic Sea. Um, and I will just talk about the concept um, over the slideshow, so who doesn't like talks about concept, he can just ignore my voice and uh, enjoy the photos. Okay, so as, as I said in, in, in the title, Yahweh is yet another hack together of West and East. And that's yet another hack together, as in yet another hackers camp. But it's also yet another, as in West and East, East and West. And I can tell you that we people from, from the East are quite fed up uh, to be invited all around uh, for whatever is at the table of political correctness to represent that there is another Europe, that there is an uh, ex-communism, countries in transition, blah, 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 blah. Uh, kind of things and uh, as we are fed up but at the same time uh, we didn't really uh, we didn't really bring those issues uh, in the hackers community and we didn't really talk about uh, a lot about some interesting moments which we uh, which which we, which we can have and there is also another thing which I think it's important and that's that all of the hackers and all of the geeks around the world these days are also quite a lot of Americans uh, especially because of the culture so I think that we also need to fight for our right to vote on the American elections and that's that could be also one of the topics on uh, on our on our um, hackers camp So yeah, uh, in in 2004 uh, we did. I'll just show you another slideshow. Together with our friends from, yeah, good joke, and not just joke. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, those photos are from the um, um, from the Transhack meeting, which we did with our uh, friends from Italy, Italian hackers, and that was in 2004. And that's the venue which we probably will use uh, for the for the Yahweh meeting. So I will just tell you a few things what we would like to see as a, as a, as a topics on the on on that uh, hack meeting. So one of the things which we would like to see is people uh, bringing collection of uh, their local geek and hacker related items from the past. So we can play with the creation of alternative another timeline of the hackers history because as we all know uh, about the uh, Richard Stallman's printer and his problems with that as we all know about the uh, pizzas in front of the Altair manufacturer by Bill Gates and the others but we really don't know a lot about our local history of, of hacking at least we don't know it in in, in Croatia and ex-Yugoslavia uh, from, from my experience um, there is also quite important uh, discussion for us, uh, and that's about the difference and similarities of what means or what is being a hacker and uh, uh, hacking uh, in different local contexts. So I will just tell you an, one, one little story from the 90s. It's more from the artistic, uh, artistic context. Uh, in the middle 90s, uh, the developed West was very, very excited and about the utopian ideas of how Internet will change the world. Um, <laughs> yeah, you can ignore my voice. <laughs> I knew. <laughs> so at that time, uh, 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 yeah, most of the West were really enthusiastic of how, how Internet will change the world and how interactive art is better than the representative art before and blah, 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 blah. But living in the, in the proclaimed utopia as we used to live in, the, uh, in, in Eastern Europe where they would Telling, trying to tell us that that's almost a perfect, uh, perfect society. We also developed some certain specific sensibility for these kind of things. And Alexei Shulgin and Lev Manovich and Boris Groys were telling to people, and I think that it's quite interesting uh, shift that 
interactive art is just another way of manipulating the audience. So they think that they are actually free to choose, but uh, they are more like free to choose as like people who are in the experimental uh, psychological uh, labs or in whatever is the lab of CIA or KGB. So that's what we would like to see also uh, on, on, on our um, hack meeting. Um, there is, yeah, I'll be very, very short now. So 30 seconds. We would like also to talk about the flow of money and uh, possible autonomy which, which, which is coming from that because there is a big issue of how to finance and how to financially support any hackers meeting and are you enough independent if you are getting any kind of um, uh, support from foundation or whatever and the people are easily, especially if they are coming from the rich countries, they are easily uh, just for the solution where people are financing themselves from like individuals but then they they don't really see that those individuals are working for the corporations for the money and what is the real difference in doing that individually or trying to gather together and then trying to do that so that's that's really just for the discussion I don't have any answer but that's what we would like to talk about um, and of course, there is also discussion of possibility of uh, hackers gathering together in some relevant political collectives, and uh, but still keeping the notion of uh, uh, of hacking, which more or less means to hack is to defer. And of course, not just about discussions and and theoretical or, or whatever. We, we would like to see as just on any other hackers conference, uh, lots of sharing skills and knowledge, and we have some kind of... Another talk, but wrapping it up. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm off. Yeah, five minutes. Way off. Way off. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that goes more into informal, uh, uh, informal meetings, and, yeah, it's and in that sense, it's just like uh, yet another hackers camp. I have a lot of flyers here, so I will just give you, so you just pick up as much as you want, and, uh, yeah, keep in contact. Thank you very much. Yo, thank you for that. Keep in mind, yet another uh, hackers thing. Uh, the URLs have been posted on the IRC channel, so hopefully you were watching. I'm not sure whether anyone is keeping track of this, but I will come up with a text file hopefully containing everything. But typing it up as you go just is a little too much here. So I will do this later on and link from that, uh, li link to it from this page. Right now, there's an official break of two minutes to reorganize. Uh, we need a break too. Um, please, uh, well, this is for input and output, right? So get your, your new input of Marta, Coca-Cola, whatever, and I'm sure you will would you would know what to do with your output, but not in here, please outside somewhere. And um, maybe it's nice if you could again move up to the far left from your so seen us from your side moving towards the uh, exits here. Thank you very much. Also 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 also, anybody um, who is speaking in the second hour hasn't given me your slides yet, um, or you have a web page or some text that you want to display during your talk, please come up and, and get that to me now so we can be um, all ready for the second hour. Thanks.
Again in a minute. Last call. We'll start again. Half a minute. Some. <laughs> Uh, guys, so can I have a hand sign by everybody who's going to be a speaker with the next round? Where are you guys? Could you just please sit in front? Yeah, anybody not in the front row all. or over here, please come on up. So, right. This is the second part of last day of Lightning Talks. Uh, we are in room four. There's an IRC channel for it if you want to follow it. That's on ircfreenow.org. The name of the channel is 23C3 underscore SAAL4. Right, we will continue uh, with Matthias Bauer on pretty slow privacy. Matthias? Hi, this is a talk about implementing a PGP-like thingy completely in shell script without using OpenSSL, libcrypto, libcrypt, tomcrypt, libbcrypt, or any other C implementation. Okay, um, we do use PGP for, well, mainly two purposes, which is encryption and decryption. Encryption is typically uh, done by calling PGP... No, 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 stay with the PGP slide, please. Sorry. Okay, um, excuse me. <laughs> okay, we use PGP by calling PGP minus E for encrypt minus R for re uh, recipient and then the key ID of the recipient. What does this really do? It creates a session key, typically using uh, dev random or something. It encrypts the file we wanted to encrypt with um, a block cipher of our choice in CB CFP mode it pads the session key up to the size of the public key and encrypts that padded session key with the public key of the um, recipient. Well, and then concatenates the session key, which we encrypted with the key of the recipient, with the file. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, can we do this on a POSIX system without any OpenSSL, PGP, GNU, PG, whatever utility? Yes, we can. If we use DC, DC is in POSIX, for the arithmetics in RC4 and RSA, and replace the block cipher in CFB mode, which is basically a stream cipher, by RC4, which is a stream cipher. And for the padding, this is um, this OAPE padding, OAEP padding, which uh, protects against uh, plain text, um, clear text guessing attacks with RSA. Um, this padding typically uses a random number generator which is constructed from MD5. Instead of that, I use RC4. And the rest is shell scripting tricks. Thank you. Um, DC is a very old project. It's older than Unix. It's some Multix tool. It's a Polish reverse multiple arbitrary precision calculator and it comes with every POSIX compliant system. It can compute arbitrary large number. That's cool because we can implement RSA in that. An example, how to convert a series of bytes written down in decimal to a large number, which would be represented by the concatenation of the bytes. Well, it's what this script does. Problem with DC code is it's extremely obfuscated, and this is even pre-Perl. Um, the three numbers 101 are our input. So that's the byte 101. And then I store 1 in the, um, in the register named C. That's the 1SC. And then I put a command on the stack, which is check if the stack is empty. If the stack is not empty, load the counter, multiply with, with, each, with the thing that's on the stack, add what we already stored in what we saw, multiply, but, and so on and so on. This converts to large numbers. If you don't understand that, read the man page. Okay, um, next slide. Okay, RC4 is a, a cipher developed by uh, RSA Incorporated. And it's a stream cipher. It has quite, uh, it has security properties which are not really easy to define because, for example, its application VEP uh, was not that clever. 
so you have to, to watch out. And RC4 allows keys up to 2048 bit. When I remember all the old CCC talks when they were discussing if you can use triple desk because triple desk only has one and, and so on. This is really the thing for the CCC people. Um, and the output is simply XORed on, this, on the clear text. And decryption is the reverse. Thank you. This is RC4 in DC with comments. <laughs> okay, this generates a key stream from a uh, S-Box array, which I stored in the big ass stack. Okay, we have to go faster. Jump. Okay. <laughs> um, PSP is pretty slow privacy. It's a bunch of forced shell scripts, about 400 lines of code, uh, connected as I sh back. Um, it's slow as moldy molasses. The RC4 shell script encrypts on my very fast laptop about 360 bytes per second, um, combined with, RC, with RSA, a 8 kilobyte text takes about, well, 170 bytes per second. Um, key, key creation has still be, to be done on another machine with OpenSSL, and it uses corn shell. So it's real born shell thingy. It works on OpenBSD. There's lots of problems with GNU tools like GNUDC and GNU SED, which are not really POSIX compliant, which turns only up if you do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, you can download the stuff at. Cool. <laughs> All right. Uh, if you ever mistyped CD as DC, now you know what you can do with it, actually. <laughs> so, uh, nice. Uh, shoestringfoundation.org, that was. Okay, keep it in mind. Somebody post this on the IRC channel. I, I don't have time for typing this. Uh, anyway, next on our list is something that is so badly printed out I can't read anymore, but it's fr fr from Oliver Moldenhauer. Are you here? Well, then you please come in front. And okay. My talk is going to be slightly less technical, <laughs> slightly more political. Um, <clears throat> it's about G the next year's G8 summit. Uh, you probably know there's every year a summit where the um, seven biggest industrial nations plus Russia meet and try to rule the world. Um, next slide, please. So I'm from the Netzwerk Freies Wissen uh, organization we just founded. Next one. Um, I try to have more than three slides per minute. Mm -hmm. so, so what is the Netzwerk Freies Wissen? Uh, we, new organization, obviously. We deal with access to knowledge and the protection of the knowledge comes against too much intellectual property. We do it rather by political work than by um, actually putting free knowledge online. Um, what is important for once we, we did work on software patents, we did work on bio patents, we did something, we're doing something on copyright. And what is important for us is to join the different IP issues, uh, whether they are seeds um, or drugs or digital media. Because usually those communities, political communities, are quite um, <coughs> disjunct. We have offices in Berlin and Bielefeld, a rather small one, Bielefeld, but there's one in Bielefeld. And we welcome support and collaboration. You can all see on www.wissensalmende.de. But coming to the G8 summit, so the um, the federal government, uh, this this is you know this uh, government thing is better done in German. So I put the German stuff on here. Um, <clears throat> so this is what the um, federal government says to their G8 strategy in some press thingy. Um, they say innovation and especially the aspect of the protection of intellectual property about product and market piratery. But also they talk about um, HIV AIDS and universal access of everybody who needs it to anti-retroviral drugs, which is a kind of contradiction. Next one. Uh, sorry for the, for the bad quality. For some reason or another, uh, the decision of the German government on the um, <coughs> agenda of the G8 summit is... Uh, secret. So we had to get some really bad facts and scan it in and stuff. Uh, and it says here, uh, innovation is the central foundation for the wealth in knowledge-based um, societies. Blah, blah, blah. Um, we see especially uh, a need to do something by the improvement of the international 
um, cooperation to the enforcement of rights of intellectual property. So that's the, the only idea in the whole paper on how to further innovation is IP enforcement. And Next slide, please. So um, <clears throat> what they also do, German government who holds this meeting, is inviting what they call the Outreach Five Countries, uh, Mexico, Brazil, India, China, South Africa, um, <clears throat> and um, talk to them about uh, join them in the G8 um, process. But the only one, only thing they mention, what they actually want to do with them, is talk about IP enforcement. At the same time, they are asking for universal access for anti-HIV drugs. If you know how bad that the international agreements on intellectual property are for access to drugs, you can imagine there's kind of a contradiction there. Next one. So, um, since from the officials from the several governments, there will only be one side of the issue presented, the only way, let's have more IP, stronger IP, and let's enforce it, um, there's going to be the necessity to bring out the other story. So uh, uh, there's some events planned, which I will invite you to, to participate. One we had on November 30th, we had a, a one-day event here in Berlin, <coughs> where we had people there from the, the sea, of people who were dealing with seeds, people who were dealing with med medicine, and people dealing with copyright to discuss those issues. We'll have um, another a longer meeting, a weekend meeting at the Protestant Academy in Felix, uh, somewhere in North Westfalen, um, where two goals. One is we want to discuss theories and actions between the different movements working with intellectual property, and we want to have um, a joint declaration on reclaiming knowledge with all those, all those groups. So we have a statement we can give out at the G8 summit uh, to have a different view. And, and then of, on this, this declaration will be prepared in the next month. So there will be in January a first a draft, and then everybody can take part in uh, discussion on that. In June, there will be big, one minute, isn't it? Minute, yeah. Yeah, big demonstrations in Heiligendamm, which is near Rostock, in case you don't know, and a counter summit where we are going to present the other ideas. Next slide. So that's, um, these are the groups who are already taking part in this process, who've been, taking, who've been part in the um, meeting in uh, end November. So, for instance, you have the Aktionsbündnis gegen AIDS, you have um, Greenpeace, you have the Protestant Development Service, you have uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, you have uh, CP Tech, you have Miserio, Buco campaign against biopiracy, and so on and so forth. Next slide. So, I'd like to invite the Chaos Computer Club. Uh, and the FFII, for that purpose, uh, to join in this process. So we have a big declaration, not actually a long one, but one with, followed by, by many groups and people, and where we can um, have a different voice in the whole debate around Heiligendamm. Thank you, and more information you'll find on Wissens <laughs> Our next presenter is Tim um, something, Kausten from Livestick. From the Netherlands. From the Netherlands. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would like to give a presentation uh, about Livestick. Livestick is a free online storage for the masses. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> It has uh, three key features. Uh, the first is accessibility. Accessibility is because uh, people store their files at their personal computer, but you get more and more devices like PDAs, laptops, uh, cell phones, stuff like that, and you want to access your data anytime from anywhere. Uh, also, a trend is that people tend to get more and more data. Uh, it's not uh, getting less, but only more. More uh, documents for school, for work pictures, anything you want to save, it's only growing. But people don't really make backups. It's uh, most of the time not well structured, not well tested. And uh, yeah, that's a, the risk is getting bigger every time. So you could 
just uh, save it on your Livestick account and uh, everything is taken care of. Uh, the third point that really sets it apart from an easy to use FTP server is the sharing files capability. So uh, you just upload, you don't uh, have to share your account, you just say this file I want to share it with that and that and that guy. Next slide please. Uh, there's a lot of skepticism about storing files online. Uh, a lot of people think, hey, that's a really bad idea, put my personal stuff on the internet. Uh, there's something to say about that. Uh, the first reason I don't think uh, that this is a problem is because most documents that get stored on this service are not highly classified NSA, FBI docs that are really of interest for anyone. Uh, the other thing is there is no wares. If you lose your wares, it's not such a big deal. You just join the, uh, some network and you download it again and you got it. But it's different with um, your, your, the pictures you took from the last summer, for instance. You don't want to lose them. It's hard to find that on an illegal network normally. So ju just save your uh, personal stuff. The, the data that is saved on this uh, service is uh, very important to the people themselves, but not really interesting for other people. Uh, the current status of the project. I've uh, been working on it for the last uh, one and a half year. Uh, I went online two weeks ago. Uh, what I have is these uh, three aspects I talked about. Uh, so it's accessibility via web interface, uh, the sharing capability, and of course the saving. Uh, and it's a very clean and nice to use interface. Now how does it look like? Like this. This is the welcome screen. It's uh, on the front page. It's just a login, uh, a registration form, and once you register, you can directly log in. Once you're logged in, you get into the overview of your personal files. Uh, it's, it's really simple. You have an upload form at the bottom of the page. It didn't fit on the screenshot, but uh, here you can see an overview of your files, and you can say share this file, and you get a pop-up and choose from anyone an email address you want to share it with. And there's also a sharing uh, file uh, capability. That's the next one. Here you see uh, all the files coming in from other users and the files you shared yourself with other users. And this is uh, basically the essential uh, functionality that uh, I'm going to build on through. Uh, next. So what are the future plans? Uh, I want to further uh, improve the user interface, make it easier to use, do stuff with less steps, and just don't be bothered with un unneeded stuff. Uh, I wanna, I'm about to release an API so developers can develop their own applications that connect with Livestick and their accounts. Uh, I wanna, currently it's only Dutch. Uh, there is an English version on its way, um, so and uh, yeah, I want to localize it to as much languages as possible, of course. But the English version is about to be released soon in a couple of months, uh, and I and I want to further integrate it with uh, other web services. Uh, think about uh, Google Office, Flickr, all these kind of web services that could really need an uh, online uh, storage uh, backend uh, underneath them. Okay. Uh, what I need, I need uh, hardware, I need hard disks, servers, bandwidth, stuff like that, as much as possible. Uh, I need sponsors for that or investors, people that are seriously interested in this, into this project. And it would be nice to get some extra development power to make all these ideas because this was only, I got so much ideas, just not the time to make it all happen. So I really need uh, developers in this uh, fast CGI, C, C programmers, uh, Ruby programmers, Rails programmers, stuff like that. Okay. So how can you contact me? I'm on MSN, kuist at hotmail.com, jobber kuist at jobber.accessforall.nl and email kuist at yahoo.com. Thank you very much. So, another nice <coughs> interface uh, for storing files. I wonder how you access uh, archives and deal with them. What's wrong with SSH? It's hard to, for most people it's hard to you would have to use the micros, otherwise nobody can hear you on the other side. Working? Hello. Uh, well, the, the problem is with SSH that it's for most people too hard to use. The, the crowd here is... Uh, it's Why not, not teach them? Yeah, you're going to teach the whole world. 
I would rather teach them than uh, telling them, please use a web browser and Maybe you click guys a lot take of this things. Outside. But there yeah, we should take this outside. Come on, we get outside. <laughs> please welcome Benjamin Harry Rion. <laughs> My name is uh, Benjamin Orion. I work for FFI Brussels, uh, the Foundation for Free Information for, uh, Infrastructure, as uh, full time. Um, next slide. Um, I try to, to explain you what's going on right now with the, after the defeat of the Software Patent Directive uh, last uh, July 2005 in the European Parliament. Um, I call my uh, presentation EU Software Patent Version 3. Um, the version 1 has happened in uh, 2000 when the uh, people, the countries, uh, signatories of the European Patent Convention signed in um, 1973 um, tried to remove the exclusion of uh, computer programs from the list of exclusions of the Convention. Uh, because it needed the unanimity, uh, they failed to do that and uh, they decided in 2000 to go for an EU directive on uh, computer implement invention of software patents. Um, in 2003, the first reading came in the European Parliament, and uh, the European Parliament uh, flipped around the, the, the directive in introducing clear exclusion of computer programs and only patentability of ABS-style uh, 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 patents. Um, in 2004, the Council of Ministers reverted the bill and, and introduced, uh, uh, with the help of uh, Fritz Bolkenstein, um, new, um, new text for um, uh, legalizing software patents in Europe. And uh, after that, the, the, um, after the decision, after the political agreement, Poland decided uh, that there was no, uh, they would not support any more the text that they have said uh, in the Council that they would support. And with the change of the weight in the council with the new countries, uh, there was no uh, qualified majority anymore for, uh, for the council to adopt its decision. Um, in, two, in July 2005, after uh, what the deputies called the most fiercest lobbying uh, uh, piece of legislation they have ever seen, the parliament uh, uh, rejected the, the software patent uh, directive. Um, so this was uh, just two days before the before the, the vote in plenary, where the, um, the 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 campaign called campaign for creativity bought, uh, uh, rented a, a yacht on the on the waters near the parliament in order to to say to MEPs that they should vote for the directive, and at the same time we had a demonstration in front of the parliament where we asked our demonstrators to just uh, take canoes and, and, and push, the, push this, this boat away. So this was really the conclusion of, of, the, of the directive. Uh, in 2006, just six months after the re rejection, the Commission uh, launched a new um, initiative to uh, revolve the European patent system in Europe, asking um, um, people uh, if, what they think about the community patent and the European patent litigation agreement. So the European Patent Litigation Agreement can be um, seen as a new attempt to introduce software patents in Europe simply because uh, the main goal is to create a central court for patents and uh, since the countries have different interpretation of uh, the, the European Patent Convention regarding software, the central court would uh, uh, centralize and, and give uh, either a clear, de a clear decision if uh, uh, such inventions are uh, patentable or not. And uh, this could be um, a chance for the, for the, um, for the EPO who re grants right now software patents to uh, have one of the judges at the central court and, and to, uh, to, to legalize the, the practice uh, they are doing. Um, so this, this uh, uh, litigation agreement can have worse effects than the directive which was uh, previously rejected simply because it can legalize software patents uh, without uh, any uh, clarification of the law in the law, and secondly, because uh, um, um, companies who want to enforce software patents could claim damages on the bigger market. Right now, they have to go country by country, and the, ca the damages are calculated um, on, on the sides of the market. Um, so, um, what is dangerous is that uh, the European Parliament won't have any power regarding the control of uh, judges. And uh, this, this kind of uh, litigation agreement is uh, 
it's a system outside outside of the European Union, so you won't have any uh, parliamentary control. You would have only uh, people who who um, who run currently the the European Patent Organization, who are mainly involved in the national patent offices. So that's what we call the patent establishment, and this patent establishment would um, appoint the judges and uh, probably pick them, the, 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 the right judges who, who would favor software patents in some way. Um, okay, I, I, I close it. Right now, the, the, the goal is to throw a spanner in, in, the, in, this, uh, in this project. Um, France and other countries are not happy with, with the fact that it's a non-EU project. And I would encourage you to uh, write to your minister and ask them uh, their position on the EPLA. Right now, the German presidency will push uh, like crazy for the EPLA. And uh, I would recommend you to uh, contact your minister in, in your different countries in order to have the position. And finally, to give uh, money to our association so that we can continue to work forward. Thank you. I have, also, I have also some flyers here I will uh, try to distribute uh, on, on the EPLA. Yes. Thank you for that. Next on our list is Sasha Proflep. Is that right? From right pronunciation? And this is on blinks and buttons? Yeah. Perfect pronunciation. <laughs> Actually, I gave this. It's the slides from the talk at Pecha Kucha, and this is even 100 seconds more, so let's see how this works out. Um, so I'm Sascha Poflep, and this project is called Between Blinks and Buttons, and was the, my thesis project at the um, Berlin University of the Arts, the UDK. And it's um, basically about networked objects. Next one. So here you see a very classic example of networked objects, and of course a much better example is the Sputniks that you can buy here. And, um, the project is about how, how, how things change when people get traceable through things and, and how, how you can use this less from a security perspective but more from, from a, as a way to establish strange links between people. So the object, next one, the object, object that I was actually looking at is the camera, the digital camera which was invented by this guy who was working for Kodak in 1975. And, in my view, photography has changed in three parts since the digital camera. Next one. The first part is that um, um, there's actually um, metadata, which was also always part of pictures, as you can see in analog pictures. It had timestamps, and some people also say that Polaroids kind of reserve this white space for tags. And the second part is that people actually uh, create archives of human experience. So they have Flickr and Flickr. There's almost a billion images downloaded every day from Flickr. So this is this, you have this huge archive of, of moments, basically. And the third part is this next one, that actually um, each, each picture represents a fraction of time. And time is part of photography. And time is also something that we share. Like time and space are the two big uh, variables that we move in. So the basic idea, actually, was that, that you could look at synchronicity between pictures. So you can, if, if I take a picture and I take the metadata that's attached to my picture, I can go to Flickr and use the Flickr API to actually see what, hell, what else happened in, a, in another spot in the world at the very same second. And I mean, there's, there's shortcomings, shortcomings in the way that uh, many cameras, or like 10% of the cameras, are not very correctly set, but as people use mobile phones and the mobile, as cameras and the mobile phones actually uh, use time servers because they are connected to the internet, this is going to fade away, basically. So um, it's basically turned out to be two projects, one table-like installation and a portable object. And the table-like installation, next one, please, um, consists of an acrylic table, two projectors, and uh, a mirror system here. And what you can do is actually you can, next one, please, you can upload your own images to the surface from your phone or camera and then you have this metaphor of a time ray of time that's running through vertically through the space and you have this little next one please this little uh, object which you can then move over your pictures and it's being tracked from below by a camera and what it does is that it um that it's running on Java and it's asking a PHP server that's connected to the Flickr API to find pictures that have been taken in the same second and they get refracted out of this prism-like thing and refracted to the walls of the thing. Next one, please. So you see um, 
you see basically someone else's photo that gets refracted out of yours, and it's very fuzzy, and it's 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 meant to be like that because it's it's kind of intended to create in some kind of link narrative. It's okay that it runs between your picture and the other one. There's also um, a space reference because it gets refracted to a certain spot uh, around here, and and it's kind of it's kind of separated into 24 zones. So if you know how it works, you can also figure out where the original the other image came from. And um, the other project, next one please, is actually a, it's a camera. So I went back to the camera and said, okay, if I can do the table, I can also make a camera that takes other people's pictures. So what you do, what, what you get is basically a blind camera that where you just um, set the moment and someone else takes the picture. And someone, recently someone called this momentography, which I found very beautiful. And basically it reduces, next one, reduces the camera to the button itself, so it's like the button is a sensor for the, the presence of a person and the sensor of, like for you basically, to, to, to um, set the moment. And the, the button actually comes from an Aquamatic uh, 901, which is like, for me always was like the, the button. <laughs> and if you press it, then it takes, takes some time, it takes a few hours. And or like right now it's getting faster and faster actually. Like initially, initially it took hours, and now it's sometimes it takes just minutes for people to upload it. And the more people use things like um, what's it called, Shozu and stuff like that, is just going to be quicker and quicker. And then even eventually, next one, an image shows up. And the funny thing about the images are that um, they are not as random as, as like everyone's image on Flickr, like the third row. It's because like you see this picture and you kind of, it's half yours because you share the moment and you have kind of, you have a memory of the moment when you pressed the button. So it's kind of, you, you have to relate to it in some way. So it's, it's always special no matter how enigmatic the images are. And inside is of course a mobile phone, which is running Java and connecting to, to the same PHP server. And um, this is next one. This is the website, and there's also videos and more documentation and stuff. And thank you for listening. So, uh, yet another view on things. Thank you very much for that. So next on our list would be very cool for schools. So where's Benny? Benny, are you here? There he is, in the very back row. It doesn't work over there. It's a feature, I think. There are officially two talks left, this one and the next one. But uh, I heard several people asking me whether there'd be uh, enough time to do anything else. So this is your chance to step in after that. Please be prepared. And uh, I am not sure whether we can have this room for even more time. Uh, I didn't ask because uh, I thought, well, if I'm going to ask, then probably get a no. If I don't ask, we just continue. So if you're happy to show whatever is on your mind, like uh, any nice tool, operating system, project, or maybe even a rant, this is your time to think about it now and give us to it later. Did you just choose Windows XP? Yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have to skip this one. <laughs> Sometimes you need to fight someone with his own weapons. So that very good thing, but you have to please put this into the micro. Oh, okay. Hello. Um, the question I want to answer today is... Um, Who are you? Oh, I'm Benny. <laughs> and, well, I'll show you how you find out more about me. Mm. Well. Do you know how to do it? 
not on Yeah, no, I don't have Alt Alt F four. Alt Alt F four. Alt F four. You just close everything. Uh, you want to switch the video? Function, function. Not F4. function F4, yeah. Oh, um, <laughs> to be written on your keyboard. How do you do this? Format C. Slash <laughs> 4. Again, join us on IRC. Uh, we've given out the address anyway, so uh, I'm not going to repeat it anymore right now. But still, I, we do want some feedback on this. So uh, unfortunately, we cannot have feedback on each talk separately on the web page. For that, we would need a lot more organization. So I think we're almost there. Um, yes. Um, well, as I already said, I want to show you if uh, you can trust in very cool or um, fingerprint-based uh, attendance systems. So, um, very cool is, is a system that's used at IBC. It's an international school in England where about half the students are foreign. So that's why it's international. And maybe that's why um, fingerprinting is used. Um, um, uh, the very cool is part of Anteon UK, which is again part of General Dynamics somehow. Um, the system was introduced about three years ago, only by the warden, so no one else was asked except the warden. No, no teachers, no parents, and that's also how the enrollment works. Because on the first day, when all the foreign students who who can't speak English uh, very well are forced to, well, are asked to um, register themselves. But, well, no one really says anything against it because in the moment you don't think about it. And the parents aren't asked e either. Um, well, when I, was when, I was in, uh, when I was registered, I got a letter afterwards uh, which told me that I don't have to. But now, now, the last year, people didn't even get this letter. Um, well, the letter said it's all standalone, um, it's a queue, and the data, the fingerprint data, is not usable um, afterwards. But of course, it's usable to recognize the fingerprint, otherwise, the system would not work. And here you can see the website where they say the fingerprint signature is made of 120 data points. Well, we'll see that later. And it doesn't say anything about encryption of the 120 data points, so I just guess it's not encrypted, otherwise they should say it. Um, and, well, again, the one that I already um, told you. So how did we get into the system? A friend of mine found on a school laptop this login.vbs. Oh, should better open it with the editor. Um, where you can... Um, well, they can edit some lines and tell the computer you are a teacher and log into the system as a teacher. Then we got all the data on the server, from the server on our hard drive, um, where I can see student data. Um, one minute. Oh, okay. Well, here's the student data. Then, oh. There, there's some encrypted XML files, which we can encrypt with um, well, a little C-sharp application we built ourselves based on the decompilation with the reflector. There's a function called decode XML, and here you get the password, dead dragon. Don't remember it.
Why don't you see the personal data? And maybe we can find out whose birthday it is today. As a matter of fact, we are officially over time, but um, I think, uh, does, is anyone interested in seeing this anymore? Yeah, yeah sure. Okay, uh, so happy birthday, Bryony. <laughs> um, well, that is, you, you can guess how it's created. C sharp program and just decrypt all the XML files. Um, well, so that's the photograph of every student the XML file and two binary files, which are fingerprints. There we got um, a little C-sharp program as well, programmed. And here we are with the fingerprint features, I guess, because they didn't say anything about encryption. Um, well, then I want to show you some, well, some funny registration pictures of some people. Um, <laughs> well, here someone was more clever than me, and that's our system admin administrator. <laughs> okay, and I want to finish off by showing you how you can find out more about the system and fingerprinting. There's one very good website, leavethemkidsalone.com. And, well, Intermedia also wrote an article about it. Um, I want to conclude by saying, well, you, don't, you can't trust very cool. And um, I also want to say that the authorities always very often deny the insecurity of the um, software. Even if you point out to them how, it's, how it really is, they, they're not going to do anything about it, just deny that it's true. Um, then there's a huge amount of personal data stored in the system. We found about 2,000 um, sets of student data. Um, and I think it's also there to prepare the future generation, the students, for biometric, uh, well, for bi biometrics, and make them not say anything against it. Um, well, then I want to cite um, something by George Orwell. Um, O'Brien said, um, it's necessary for us to know everything. Thank you. Yes, thank you for pointing out this, that very cool project is not so very cool after all, but thank you for a very cool talk. Thank you. So next, uh, I, I think you can introduce yourself. Um, what about? Okay, I'm uh, René Bakels. I work at part-time at Maastricht University. Can everybody hear me? And uh, the, um, so that leaves me some time to, to talk to politicians occasionally. And uh, I talk, for, um, one of the things I talked about is um, the enforcement of intellectual property rights. It is one topic like um, Oliver Mollenhauer also touched upon. Um, currently, the European Commission is working on a, a directive for enforcing the criminal, um, for criminal enforcement of intellectual property rights. Well, some of you who are familiar with law know that there are international treaties. Uh, most countries, the, the, it, it, it is already a crime. To, uh, for copyright infringement, patent infringement, and so, and so on. So this appears to be largely uh, redundant. But then I talked to uh, one particular politician, I won't mention his name, but he is German, and, um, and they said, well, but what's, what's, really, what's really the issue? And then it uh, turned out that, well, it, it's, uh, it, it turned to be out very, something very, very emotional. 
that is, um, well, there has been a debate whether this, 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 the substance of this directive is currently still being debated, and the question, one of the questions is whether it should really uh, it should just be a real piracy, one-to-one -one copying in, 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 a, in, a, in the industrial fashion, or whether it should um, be more encompassing. And um, actually, this politician told me, yes, no, it should include everything, including private downloading. Well, it, as you know, it has always been outside of copyright. Private copies have been have been free. But he says, no, it's we have to educate. Apparently, he talked to the... It's, it sounds all very similar to the story we heard yesterday from uh, Lawrence Lessig. Apparently, these politicians are being lobbied by the gramophone record companies, and they um, learned him, these politicians, that um, it's actually it, it, it's a kind of theft. And if we don't educate the kids that stealing, that downloading a uh, MP3 file um, is is the very same thing as stealing, and so if if they uh, get the idea that stealing MP3s is allowed, they will steal a bicycle tomorrow and they will steal something in a shop to, the day afterwards. And I thought, well, I, I said this to this politician, well, you're educated as a lawyer, so same, same as I am, and you, you are probably aware that intellectual property, while well, we recognize since, I think, 150 years, that intellectual property is not the same as real property, because you can, cop you, you can copy things and still maintain them themselves. No, said this man, this, this is, this is, that's not the problem. We have to educate, we have to boost the morale, we have to learn the people that uh, we have to be very, very tough on this. And then some, some, someone, it was an, another debate with a politician with the same, same type of opinion, said, how are you prepared to enforce this thing in the private homes? That's one of the reasons it has been always outside of copyright law is that you, are, uh, you, you can't uh, put a policeman in every, in every, every house. And then he says, well, even if we don't enforce it, it just should be. It should be a crime. It should be. We should do everything possible. And uh, well, he got really emotional. So I suggest. Um, well, this this little story um, gives us uh, some messages. Um, I think the the, the 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 whole debate is beyond reason. It, it's it's becoming very much an emotional debate. One of the ideas of the inf enforcement directive is also to bring. To, to increase the influence of the European uh, Union on criminal law. They want to be tough on crime. That's, that's, a, that's a big fashion, and they're using now intellectual property law, for well, which, which is a, something that, well, not in this audience, but normally politicians are not very interested in, in, in copyright law and patent law, and even less in trademark law. So they use this kind of hidden thing to, to, to increase their grip on... Um, on criminal law, and they are helped by the uh, bodies like the IFP and the RA in, in, in the United States. And I think, well, you know, because Brussels is, is operating slightly outside of the limelight, there's not much uh, feedback. It's, well, if, if something happens in the Bundestag or the, um, the Bundesrat, then, then it's, 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 it's on the television the same evening. But if something happens in Brussels, nobody knows. So they're an ideal, ideal target for lobbyists. And that means that well, there should be a counter-lobby. And the uh, FFI is doing a strong counter-lobby. I think it's a, it's a major innovation. It's, it, you know, FFI, FFI is a kind of open um, network of people of all kinds. And, and they, they are doing the, the, the counter-lobby. And, and that's, that's badly necessary because otherwise, they, I think these politicians, they are prepared. They're the old-fashioned people. Uh, Lessig said yesterday that, uh, the, the, the judge who decided in the U.S. was 70 years old. They're the kind of people who never touch the Internet. And I think they're prepared to close, close down the Internet, at least P2P, because they believe it's a Sodom of Gomorrah of, of, uh, <laughs> of, uh, of, of, of copyright infringement, and they don't grab any idea of the, of the, of the new world of information sharing. And I think we should be, be very tough on this. Thank you. So I'd like to apologize. I think I skipped Alex. Um, if you're ready, please come on up. Oh, I, I, I signed the last one. So, <laughs> uh, so I have lots of time here. So, so, so I also don't mind being the last one, signed as the last one. Uh, can um, I just stop you for, for a second? Um, so this is going to be the last talk. So take all the time you want. <laughs> unless, unless you guys here have an issue to bring before us or even just to bring before the camera, even 
if everybody leaves, right? So as long as we have the room, as long as there's the camera with us and people watching and hopefully giving us feedback on IRC, then we might as well continue. So think about what you have to say and then please come up here after Alex has finished, if he does finish. <laughs> so, uh, but he hasn't started yet, sorry for that. So please, Alex, have uh, some time. So um, please think quick that you find something to resolve me from being here. Um, so um, what I want to talk about is um, non-technical problems that you might get with um, voting computers or election computers. So um, there were some, some, um, some readings where uh, people talked about all the technical problems that might happen and that will happen and that are difficult or not solvable. Um, but um, when I heard the first time of um, election computers, um, I th thought I got this nightmare of um, I'm in this um, election booth and I look on this colorful window screen and I see this, those parties there and um, well actually I just have those maybe maybe in a village two buttons maybe somewhere in a, in a city like Berlin there might be ten or also if it's uh, for the federal government um, election some more but um, then there are those, those buttons and a button for submit so maybe I see those buttons and maybe I just want to press submit with no one. And uh, then comes a pop-up, oh, you made some mistake, you have to vote someone or make too much. So um, the thing which I um, think it uh, might be a big problem if it's not implemented that you can't make an invalid um, vote. So um, the other thing is with this, uh, if you have this piece of paper, um, you can also communicate to somebody with it. So if you're fed up by this vote, for what reason ever, there are various reasons why you um, don't want to vote somebody. So, um, for example, if you're in a small village and there's this, in Germany, you have this, uh, the CDU, the Christians, and uh, the SPD, and they're also, you know, if they are in the village, um, what they do is... Um, some farmer, he has land, and uh, he says, oh, this land is for uh, building houses, and um, he wants it to be uh, land for building houses, and they uh, make the thing to each other at this, that there will be houses, and he gets a lot of money off the land, and you don't want to vote for anyone like this. Um, so you try to avoid your um, election, your, your voice. And um, then another reason is that there are people who um, oppose the system of voting, but they also don't want to stay at home and um, say, oh, oh um, they don't want to be like, um, oh, all those people are not political. So you want to go to the election and say, I'm political, but I don't agree with the whole system which is running here. Um, so I lived in the, uh, or I grew up in the area of Helmut Kohl, and um, so... Um, Actually, the, the election was two weeks before I got 18, so I was not allowed to vote. But anyway, we got a change. Then we had this red-green um, government, and nothing changed. Even for the thing with nuclear power, they got confirmation to continue, which they didn't have even before. And uh, so uh, I figured out this old anarchist proverb is, is true, that um, if an election would change anything, it wouldn't. It would be illegal, <laughs> but I think elections are still um, a, a still a place where you can communicate something. Um, also, another now, well, I could say so. This all annoys me so much. I don't want to go there. But for example, in Luxembourg, I don't know if it's yet like this, but it used to be um, that it's not the right to um, go to the election. You had the duty to go, go to the election, so the standard fine was six weeks in prison for not going to the elections. So imagine you have, a, uh, you have an election computer. You have to vote for somebody because somebody forgot or didn't want to implement uh, that you make a void election. 
And uh, so you're forced by law to, to vote somebody you don't want. And well, so if you, I don't know where you all come from, but if you get old, maybe if you get to such a situation, maybe something you could do was, would be made, and you can also do it without voting computers, making, for example, a, a party which is called nonsense or none of the above or stuff like that, for example. So then you can make, a, when there's an election, you can make, a, you can make posters in the streets and uh, say that it's the, the, the election itself is garbage and also or any kind of political statement and you can make give, give, or give back people the opportunity to um, void their election sheet. What they, people don't, what you cannot do is if you, you know, if you don't want to go to the elections or to, to, to vote for someone um, with a piece of paper it's the nice thing is I can make say I make my eggs at the right place as taking the piece of paper and making the X or I can put an A on it and make a circle around it and so at least the person who's counting the sheets will read it. And I've heard from people who did the job that they read a lot of stuff on those um, sheets for the election and um, well, those people are not political uninterested, so this is, uh, I think, another thing which it's worth for it to fight um, against um, election computers. So I hope you found some topic to talk about. Uh, I'm finished. You have a question? Take the microphone, please. People are watching, so they would probably want to hear a question. My question is related to how do you convince uh, people that electronic voting is uh, somehow um, stealing their rights from the uh, paper ballot system. Um, in Belgium there is an association called Pour Eva, which is uh, for a, a ethic uh, um, automated system. Uh, basically the position is very simple, is that um, um, the electronic voting system uh, doesn't uh, uh, pre um, give the same rights as the uh, paper ballot system. The only compromise they have found is to have a paper ballot system counted um, automatically by a laser uh, pointed machine and, and that's uh, I think that's the only good compromise you can find between uh, el pure electronic voting and paper ballot system. So I wanted to have your impression on that. Well, um, maybe the, the, this kind of scanner will have problems if you write anything on the sheet, but uh, maybe you won't notice. That might be a problem. So um, this would be for, I think it's, it's a duty of, of local groups or to, to, uh, um, to found local groups to, to work on that. So uh, I, I don't think there will be a big organization that will stop um, any kind of political trouble somewhere. It's just the people themselves they have to organize. We have seen it with, with uh, free software, like uh, it's, it's possible to organize. Um, so in, in my opinion, for example, with this uh, voting system and all this stuff, it's, it's we had this, uh, you know, in former times you had this system with religion and the order which was wished by God and stuff like that, and that got re replaced by the voting system. So, to make people believe that they are themselves who decided that things are like they are, but they aren't. It's, nothing changes if you vote. Um, so, um, I think I'll also in where you come from, if you come from Belgium, you have you have to make a group, you have to get your ideas to, to work on the, on the specific um, problems um, which um, appear, like, in, like the, they are saying how to um, make their voting computer system. So you have to react on that. I can't give any global thing. Also, this whole thing, what I'm talking about here is quite spontaneous. So <laughs> I'm, I'm just here, I saw the... Um, the readings about the voting computers, and um, actually, I'm also a congress hopping. So, greetings from the Jugend Umwelt Congress, which takes place in Königs Wusterhausen near Berlin. Cheers.
Um, so anybody who came up with something to say, why don't you come on up here and form a little line. Um, I'm going to take the liberty of going first, if that's all right. Um, so uh, two things. First of all, I just wanted to say that um, this has been an excellent Congress. And I think one of the reasons that it's been an excellent Congress is that um, it's, um, you know, my impression is that it's the most international Congress I've seen so far. And um, <laughs> uh, being an American, that's something special <laughs> for, for me to see at a HackerCon. Um, I'd really like to say that having this, having these events be multinational has been um, a very eye-opening experience for me and I think probably a good thing for everyone. And um, on that note, I'd like to remind um, or to, uh, to announce, maybe, um, it's my understanding that for the first time, at least in recent history, the uh, CCC camp will probably not be on the same day as DEF CON. Um, which is, <laughs> thank goodness we can play together, right? <laughs> um, so um, with any luck, we can, we can organize, you know, troops of people to come to both events. And um, just, you know, to mark that on your calendars now, in the beginning of August next year, there's going to be two very, very big hacker events. And if you can find a way to make it to both of them, we can make it the biggest event, you know, ever. It could be tens of thousands of people um, getting together. So that's my... <laughs> um, the date for DEF CON has been announced, I believe. Um, it is going to be the first weekend in August. The date for the camp has not been announced, but um, we're working together, and they don't want to have it on the same day as DEF CON. So it'll, it'll probably either be a week before or a week after, something like that. So I don't want to announce any data I don't have <laughs> specific numbers for, but um, just so you're aware, they'll be close together, and uh, they'll be around that time of the year. Thanks. Well, actually, uh, I, uh, some, somewhere I've seen the date. I think in the opening of this uh, Congress, Tim announced that the camp to be on something like August 9th to 14th. I'm not quite sure about this now. They might announce now. it at the closing ceremonies with any luck. Yes, probably would have to so watch closely at the closing ceremony about the dates of uh, the CCC camp. And if you have any event to, to announce or whatever, please come up stage. Dan, how about you? Nothing exciting. Um, hi, Mom. Happy birthday. <laughs> Anyone else? Anything else? I mean, it could be really anything. Announcing uh, your pet project, your latest shell alias, anything. All right. Well, um, uh, are you, you ready? Besides, I'm offline here now. Some something <laughs> turned me off ten oh, no. minutes ago. So maybe if it was you, then. Please at least give me a clue of how you did it. <laughs> no, I didn't do this. Uh, well, uh, I, uh, I don't know if anyone is still interested in this, but I, I just thought uh, I'd give a quick advertising plug of Psyche. I don't know, has anyone here heard of Psyche or Psyche or Psyche Space? And um, uh, I've heard a lot uh, about XMPP and Jabba on this uh, conference, and I, I found uh, Psyche, or Psyche actually to be quite interesting. It can bridge uh, RC networks, uh, Jabba multi-user chat, and the uh, Jabba network together, and uh, it has another um, protocol called Psyche, and you can find more about it on psyche.eu and uh, psych.org and uh, psych.us and um, it is a really interesting protocol because unlike Jabber it has actually some sophisticated uh, broadcasting of packets for example if you have uh, hundreds of contacts on uh, jabber.ccc uh, you if it was a psych server to server protocol you could just um, send one single presence from your Jabber server uh, Psych server to uh, CCC, but uh, Jabber actually sends 100 uh, for each user one. And um, I'm not actually a developer. I'm not doing anything with um, Psych except using it. But um, you can find uh, Perl libraries, and uh, there's even a no Java library, and you can uh, 
Well, I think you can actually do all the fancy stuff you can do with uh, with Jabber. You can also do it with Psyc. And um, there's currently another um, a new implementation of Psy going on called PPP, and it is written in Pyke, and it's really interesting because the the code is absolutely clean because you have a great level of uh, inheritance, and you don't need any XEPs. You can just transparently uh, enhance the protocol, and it won't disturb anything. And um, yeah, um, I think it's just a great uh, way to bring together IRC users and um, Java users because they can all meet in uh, MUC like environment and you can connect to the site with either a Jabba uh, client like C or game or whatever or with an IRC client or with native site clients or with Telnet even. So there are just many possibilities. So if you're interested in instant messaging or multi-user chat, Please consider taking a look at Psyc, and um, I don't know if any one of you know this um, great, uh, or maybe not so great German security group called Buha, and they have recently migrated to Psyc space, and um, Psyc also hosts the um, Europe Music Awards, and uh, the online chat, and this highly distributable, I think that is not the, uh, something, uh, maybe maybe e -Jabber -D can do it, but but uh, the Jabber multi-user chats are not really flexible. Thank you. Just a second there. So I just met Carlo recently, and he's been doing psych for a decade now. Yeah. So why hasn't it taken over everything, and why? where are the clients? Where are the users, actually? Yeah, yeah this is it's quite a true uh, criticism. Um, he started it in 1995, I think, when he also invented the me command for IS3, uh, or at least that's what he claims. And, uh, yeah, for some reason... Uh, there are, well, I say, um, aside from the events, there are maybe, if we are um, well, looking at it very positively, there are 20 users in Psyche space. Um, but uh, it's very interesting because um, the, um, you can actually link Psyche to an IRC server, and then um, the users on the IRC server get uh, the opportunity to message transparently um, ICQ uh, over Jabber Transport, any Jabber user, and just via private message. But what is not yet working is um, actually um, joining uh, Jabber Mo MOOCs and uh, the IRC chat rooms on the IRCD. That's not working yet. Um, and um, but <clears throat> well, the whole thing is open source. But um, uh, I have to admit, Carlo also makes uh, money from it, uh, from T Online and MTV uh, for the, for hosting these uh, large scale events. Um, but it's very interesting technology. And um, yeah, I actually can't answer the question why it's not so popular. I guess uh, Jabba just did some better ad marketing or something. So I see um, just a few people left here, but Thanks. this is your chance. I mean, the camera's here for you. I'm pretty sure there must be <laughs> millions of people waiting outside for your talk. So. <laughs> you could repeat your talk too, Justin. <laughs> All right, I think we should wrap it up. Well, Mel, maybe let's give some more uh, hints on. I'm not online anymore. No, somebody has cut me off. <laughs> so <laughs> if you're still watching, maybe we meet again on some other event scheduled here in Europe. As far as I know, a few more events. Just a sec, they hold it. Um, just a few more events, like at the end of uh, January, uh, there's the end. no, it's January, f February 1st and 2nd in Luxembourg, so go there. At uh, the end of Jan February, it's the FOSDEM Developer Conference, and on first weekend of March, it's the Linux Days in Chemnitz. And of, of, obviously, there, there must be an Easter hack on Easter, again in Hamburg. So come here again on Easter Hag to meet the CCC people. See you there. <laughs>